This is the Drummer's Resource Podcast, session 90. And the quote of the day is from James Von Prague, who said, We have all been placed on this earth to discover our own path, and we will never be happy if we live someone else's idea of life. You're listening to the Drummer's Resource Podcast, home of in-depth interviews with the world's greatest drummers and industry professionals. Information, education, and motivation for drumming and beyond. What's going on, everybody? Nick Ruffini here with another session of the Drummer's Resource Podcast, and we are 10 away from the 100th podcast. I can't wait for that. It's amazing. Anyway, this session is brought to you by Boso Bamboo Drumsticks, the world's first full line of bamboo drumsticks. Check them out at bosodrumsticks.com, and you can save 15% on your entire order by using the promo code PODCAST. Uh, when you check out, you get 15% off. So check them out, Boso Drumsticks. Dot com, the world's first full line of bamboo drumsticks. Also, if you're looking to grow your fan base, increase your exposure, and ultimately get more gigs, check out my free webinar, Marketing for the Modern Musician. And I'll show you how to do all of that stuff using social media, your website, and mailing lists. Check it out at drummersresource.com forward slash register for more information. They're 100% free, and I do them every week. So check it out, drummersresource.com forward slash register. Let's get into this interview today. I have Calvin Rogers, who is a phenom drummer as far as I'm concerned, uh, really well known in the gospel industry and has played with the lists of, of who's who in the gospel world. Uh, he's also toured with R. Kelly and a bunch of other people. And he really talks about forging his own path in the music industry and, and in the gospel world, which a lot of people told him that he couldn't do. So I really love this interview because it's packed with some information. It's packed with some great knowledge. And, uh, and, and Calvin's just a, a great dude to chat with. So without further ado, let's get into this interview with Mr. Calvin Rogers. Calvin, what's happening, my man? Thanks for doing this. Hey, Nick. Thanks for having me, man. How are you? Uh, I'm great. We were just talking about how we're both freezing, and I mentioned for some reason I thought you were in L.A., but you are in, in Chicago. So Yeah, I'm in Chicago, the windy city, man. We got all this cold and snow here, man, so just trying to keep it warm, man, you know. There you go. So do you, do you, uh, do you visit Vic's Drum Shop a lot? I do visit Vic's Drum Shop a lot. I, I have to admit, you know, um, I don't I, – I don't – frequent um music stores a lot these mm -hmm. days uh but uh vix has kind of made it uh it's, I, I, i'm giving them a great advertisement but vix has made it kind of fun back to going back to the drum shops it kind of takes you back to being a kid again yeah and there uh with so many of the bigger stores and commercial stores now uh kind of only basically carrying the you know the you know the necessary items uh, for drumming at least, um, I kind of found it, I started finding it very boring even yeah. before I had any sponsorships or endorsements or anything like that. Uh, I've always been into trying to, you know, find various tones and sounds and different, come up with different ideas for drums. And, uh, before I, even before I had, like, even, like I said, before I had any deals or anything, uh, I just kind of got bored with going to the drum shops. Uh, and then, you know, along came the five star drum shops and then, but it's still hard for those guys to come compete yeah um with the majors so we lost here in chicago you know we had we used to have a place called midwest percussion mm -hmm. that was a five-star drum shop but you know again trying to compete with the you know the major retailers and stuff like that has just been hard uh so now we've got vix drum shop and um what I, I, I usually go down to Vic's drum shop if, you know, for la at the last minute I need something very, very, very specific, you know, that say I don't have time to order um, and I need something very specific. It could be a hardware piece or, you know, something like that, a matching matching hardware piece or a lug or, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. But uh, as of late, also, I've been going down to Vic's drum shop because uh, when I try to decide, you know, on I've, I've been experimenting with different symbols sounds and things like that even with uh with drums actually um, i went down to vix um when i was trying to make a decision on which pearl kit and we'll get to that later maybe but which pearl kit i was going to play and uh they had a a nice very nice pearl uh reference pure a reference reference pure down there that uh 
they had down there, and I went and checked out and kind of, you know, just play with it, set it up. And so I love that place. We've got a, they, they've got everything down there. And then Vic's personal room, he's got his old kit set up in right, there. It's, right. It's pretty. You know, it's pretty amazing what he's done there, and you're right. This would be a great advertisement for Vix, but yeah, it and, it, and we're just talking about it out of love. It's not. Like, I mean, so if you're you know ever absolutely. in the Chicago area, definitely go yeah. down to check out Vix. But he didn't pay us for this, or anything. no, he sure did. He sure did. He sure Maybe did. we should send him a bill. Yeah, <laughs> send him an invoice. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Great. It's a great. It's a great place, though. You it know, is. It is. It's it's made again. Like I said, it's made it you know kind of fun visiting the, the drum shops again. It takes you back to being a kid. Mm-hmm. I grew up you know, in, in Chicago, Illinois from, you know, um, you know, somewhat of a average family, you know, average income family. So, you know, I didn't necessarily have, I didn't have, not necessarily, I didn't have any high end drum gear. You know, my parents bought me a Pearl export when I was eight years old and, um, you know, they didn't even buy me cymbals. I had a five piece kit, uh, with a snare drum and a, and a set of hi hats and a kick pedal, mm-hmm. and I, I I played on that kit for like four years, and you know, um, you know, according to my dad, it's it's if my dad were alive and you asked him about my playing, he'd say it's why my pocket is the way it is because I spent years and years uh, just playing drums with just a set of hi hats, no cymbals or splashes or anything like that. So mm-hmm. um, you know, but. On weekends, you know, I, well, my dad was a musician, so I would get, be able to go into the guitar centers and play all, all their drums with the mini cymbal setups and all that stuff. So right, right. Vix kind of takes you back to that, nice. uh, you know, take, takes me back to that thing. So I like going in there, checking out the new gear, nice. you know, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Right, right, right. And, you know, that's the that's the perfect lead in because you were just talking about um, when you were a kid and, and growing up and, and getting into playing drums. And I always like to get the backstory on my guests that I have on the show. So just tell the audience a little bit about about who you are, what you do. And then if you could tell us a little bit of history of how you got into playing drums. Well, I'm, um, again, I'm Calvin Rogers. I'm, I'm from Chicago, Illinois, and uh, I've been mostly uh, mostly working with um the pretty much, I guess you could say something like something like the who's who's list of contemporary gospel music. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with everyone from John P. Key to Shirley Caesar to Fred Hammond to Kirk Franklin, Mary Mary, uh, Vashon Mitchell, Israel Houghton, Martha Manizzi, uh, Marvin Sapp, um, um, uh, and, and you got a lot of people in between, like a Stampley. There's, a, you know, a host of people in between there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and just over the last probably 10 or 15 years, I've just played and recorded probably with everyone in gospel, Yeah. um, you know, traditional and contemporary, you know, uh, the Clark sisters, uh, Donald Lawrence, Karen Clark, sheared, uh, you know, Dwayne Woods, the, the, all of the, you know, artists that, you know, uh, are newer and, and a lot of the ones that are older you know i've, mm-hmm. I've had the, uh, the opportunity and the privilege of working with all of those guys and uh i i'm 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 a thir- i'm 36 years old i grew up playing in church and uh my, my dad is a uh was a musician i lost my father in 2013 ah, my father was a musician that. thank you man uh, uh my dad was a musician uh singer and songwriter and he started off playing guitar and moved to keyboards and then became a, a noted songwriter here in Chicago. And he wrote some very popular songs and gospel music. And, uh, you know, uh, so I, I grew up, just grew up. Uh, my, my dad says that, uh, would say that, you know, when I was in my mother's womb, that he knew I was going to be a boy and he knew what he was going <laughs> to name me. And uh, he knew I was going to be a musician. He prayed to God that I would be a musician, actually. And so, uh, you know, I grew up. And my, my, my mom tells this story about how I ruined countless sets of cookware because the only way she could kind of get me to kind of be still and kind of if she was at home trying to cook or clean or do anything is uh, she would uh, essentially, well, from the beginning she would say, you know, I was always taking things like coat hangers and stuff like that, pencils, pens, making drumsticks out of them. But then at some point, I began to dent up her cookware because I would take spoons and beat on the bottoms of her pots and pans. Right. <laughs> and uh, 
she bought countless sets of cookware. So she says when I was a kid and, uh, I was, you know, I, I grew up and fell in love with church. I took some, some, uh, formal training when I was a kid. Cause my dad really wanted me to get into being a piano player and reading music and, you know, things like that. He wanted me to be educated cause my dad was just a self-taught musician, but he mm-hmm. taught himself everything, he taught himself how to read, taught himself how to play and wow. uh, really a very, very noted musician. And, um, to his credit, uh, we would know a lot more about him if, uh, he hadn't, if he didn't be, if he hadn't became a father and gotten married and, uh, just decided that he wanted to take a different route. I'd say all the time that I believe that my father, he, uh, he, he, he made a decision to kind of, uh, put down the hopes of chasing his dreams and to do what he needed to do so that at some point in my life, I would be able to chase my dreams. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, he took a, a, a steady position at a church, uh, stopped going on the road, stopped traveling, took a steady position at a church right. and became like a minister of music at a church and, uh, and became a father to me, really poured into me. He still worked with a lot of musicians in Chicago. And so here in Chicago, we're kind of a gospel mecca. It's the home of so many uh, famous gospel musicians, no, most notably, you know, Thomas Dorsey, mm-hmm. who is, you know, quoted as being the father of contemporary gospel music. Uh, music. So, uh, and then we've got, you know, lots of people like that. My dad worked with people that were connected to or directly, um, he, he worked directly or people that were directly connected to people like Milton Brunson and the Thompson Community Singers. Um, he recorded guitar with Albertina Walker and James Cleveland, things like that. Hmm. And so a lot of times, even as a kid, um, I would spend time with him as in rehearsals. Uh, and I would, I would be sitting around tons of professionals and uh, he saw how excited I was and how much, how into it I was. And he just continued to pour that into me, continued to take me around with him. And I would get kind of just one-on-one lessons, not necessarily what people would teach me anything, but I just sat and watched and listened. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, you He's know, taking I took it all in, taking it all in. And so that was, that was me from the time I was maybe about maybe, you know, five years old until I was like 10 or 12. And I'm, I'm, you know, getting this, these kind of, I'm getting the, the access to the minds and the music of people that will go on to become legendary, uh, in gospel music and beyond. Right. So, uh, that was, that was kind of, you know, how I, how I started again, you know, uh, when I was about eight years old, my dad bought me a drum kit and, uh, you know, I just, I stuck with it. I played every day. I wasn't, I wasn't a sports guy. I'm, I'm, I'm into sports, but I can't really play any of them. Right. Um, and I just spent my time behind a drum kit every day. You know, I'd come home, uh, do some school work, and then I'd get behind the drums. And mm-hmm. that's really what I did with, you know, with, with, with my childhood and um, even into high school. And so, um, you know, when I was probably maybe about 13, um, you know, a guy that worked with my dad, um, he knew he was working with an artist by the name of Ricky Dillard, um, who was just nominated for a Grammy this year uh, mm. for a song for having like the number one song in the country or in gospel music. Um, and so we uh, he, he remembered me and he said, man, are you still playing? Are you really playing? And I'm like, yeah, man, I was 13 years old. And he said, man, well, um, I'm, I'm a music director for Ricky Dillard now. And um when we're looking for some young guys, you know, to play, play in a band and I'd love to have you. And so I was 13 years old and I went and went to a rehearsal and audition and, uh, Ricky Dillard knew, he knew my family. And so he came and spoke to my family. And then at 13 years old, I basically started traveling and recording, uh, as a professional, really. Wow. Uh, my very first trip actually my very first playing ride i was 13 years old and i flew out to la to do a taping of uh the paula poundstone show i remember that show <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I, I did a taping with uh ricky dillard and uh i just went from there i recorded some albums with him i recorded with him and i was with him from the time i was 13 till i was about maybe 22 um and i again it was just a it was a complete journey i was fortunate enough that a lot of artists were so um they were so impressed with me as a teenager and and as a young man uh that even when 
I wasn't fully developed as a musician, they were able to see the potential in me and uh, they would give me second chances. My, my my first live record with Ricky Dillard is a complete disaster. I was 14 <laughs> years old and I had no sense of recording. I, um, I, I, I didn't necessarily know how to play with a click track or a drum loop. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I was excited when the lights and the cameras came on and it was just a complete disaster, you know. Um, and some clips of it on YouTube. And every time anyone posts clips or they tag me on Facebook or something like that, man, my, my spirit just cringes because I'm just like, <laughs> this is this is a wreck. But um, again, you know, even the producers and the the artists, they, uh, they knew that I had something. And so they would allow me to work through it. And I've just really been fortunate and blessed to be in that position often. I've been in that position often, even uh, with my current position with Fred Hammond. I've been with him for 12 years now. Um, I've been his music director for about nine years. And I kind of, I just fell into the position. And it would have been easy for him. Fred Hammond was a multi-Grammy nominated artist and, um, uh, it is considered a legend he is he is very very, very huge and mm-hmm. he's considered the the author of you know praise and worship in the contemporary african-american church he he's the inventor of it they call him the architect of it right and so there are tons of musicians you know secular and and gospel who were dying to work with this guy and uh he saw something in me, and when the music director position kind of became open, he saw that I had a heart for his music. I necessarily had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know where to start. I didn't know anything about being a music director. I just knew that I could convey ideas, and I knew the things I heard in my head. But uh, again, you know, when I first started, man, it was just it was a wreck, you know. Mm-hmm. Having the wrong, having the wrong guys around, having the, you know, being being a drummer and a music director nowadays is very quite popular, but it was kind of unheard of, especially in gospel music. Uh, back when I was when I was taking over it as a music director, people were going, "How does he voice his ideas? How does he give the arrangements? How does he teach? How does he explain it?" And you know, it was it was weird, it, and it was a process that I had to I had to go through and I had to figure it out mm-hmm. and. Uh, no, it was trying at times, but Fred, he stuck with me and he allowed me to go stay the course and go through the process. And uh, now, you know, I've, I've I've been music director and one of his, uh, I, I am his lead co-writer and co-producer. I've produced uh, his last two or three albums. I've become a songwriter under his tutelage. I've become a producer under his tutelage and I've gone to produce records that, you know, that didn't have anything to do with Fred Hammond, all from the tools and the things that I've learned kind of with him because he, you know, he just gave me that shot. Right. That's amazing. That is absolutely yeah. amazing. And there's something that I really want to pull out of that is the fact that two things that you've mentioned. One, you said, you know, there was the, the first recording and it was a complete disaster. Yeah. And two, that you got this MD job and you had no idea what you're doing. You didn't, you, you were like, I don't even know where to start. But the yeah. fact is that you recovered one from that failure where you had the complete disaster. And two, with the MD job is that you, you figured it out. And the, the main thing is that you, you tried and, yeah, you know, that's a message that I always try to convey through the podcast and on the website is that, you know, I didn't know how to do a podcast before I started doing this or there's a, you know, like I didn't 10, 15 years ago, I didn't know what I was doing in the music business, but if you, yeah. you know, you gotta, you gotta at least try and fail if you, if you ever want to succeed, you know? Yeah. And, 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 you know, and that's why, um, and, and to speak on, and when we talk about the Ricky Dillard record in that first album, uh, the thing that probably was the most important thing is that I probably, I, I don't even know if I had a clue that I was making such a mess of this live record. Right. Uh, you didn't know what the, you didn't know. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know what I didn't know, right. you know, it, because I was just a kid that grew up in church and loved playing drums. I loved it so much. And, you know, and, you know, and, and in church, Unfortunately, you know, we kind of we learn things backwards. We learn all of the most complicated things first. Right. And then, you know, and then we and then we have to get instructions on how to on the basics, on the fundamentals. So, mm-hmm. you know, we learn the tricks and the and the and the and, the, and, the, and the, all of the fancy stuff 
we learn all of that first and then you know someone has to come back and teach us how to play to a click track or how to play basic two and four pocket right so I don't think that I knew I, I didn't even know that I was making a mess of this record but one of the producers came over to me midway through the record and he just said he said man he said you're going to make a complete fit a mess of your career if you don't clean yourself up on this record hmm. I think I maybe had three songs left and uh, he said, man, he said, whatever's left of this record that you have to play, just play the songs and that's it. Right. Just play the songs and that's it. And so uh, he didn't have to do that. That guy didn't have to do that. His name is Ernie Allen. He was he wrote the title track for that record that I played on, which was Ricky Dillard, Hallelujah, Live in Chicago. And he didn't have to do that. He came over to me and he said that to me. And I, 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 I went and played the last few songs and was done and then uh i just started i just started researching i just started studying recording drummers i started looking at credits and seeing look, looking at credits and finding the drummers whose names i, I saw the most on mm -hmm. albums and then i started studying them and i started picking up their trades and then that's really kind of when i got but i was already into joel smith but and he's a drummer that is famous for working with the Hawkins family, Walter and Edwin Hawkins. Mm -hmm. Edwin Hawkins is the writer of Oh Happy Day. And Walter Hawkins is his brother, and they're a famous, famous family. Joel Smith is their nephew. He's a famous bass player and drummer. He's mm -hmm. absolutely probably the most influential bass player in gospel music and arguably the most influential drummer in gospel music. I know that, I don't know, I can't think of another drummer who's probably influenced more drummers directly mm -hmm. and indirectly. Um, but I started listening to him a lot. I started listening to a lot of, and I broadened my horizons to past gospel music. I started listening to Ricky Lawson. That was right around the time I remember, I remember going to Guitar Center and seeing this big poster of Ricky Lawson playing with Michael Jackson. He had the mm -hmm. Ricky Remo sign and, uh, the Ricky Remo bass drum head. And I remember starting to find stuff that he was playing on. I started looking for him. And there was no internet, so I, I had to do a lot of researching, you know. Yeah. And uh, I just started looking for, I just started looking for stuff, and I don't really know how. When I think about that now, I was like, how did you research things with with no with no Google? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I just I would just start going through albums, and I just start looking for them, and I I would probably read the drum magazines, uh, and they would list albums that these guys were playing on, and I would go get them. I would take my church check, and I made thirty five dollars a week at a church, and I would take that money and go to Sam Goody. Mm -hmm. and buy tapes and CDs that I see I would see in the drum magazines and I started listening to Dave Welko and Vinny Kaliuta uh and and Gad and 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 uh I also started uh, a Terry Baker who's a, a a drummer that's from Kentucky but plays a lot of gospel records I started studying him I started studying uh a lot just a lot of different people mm -hmm. Ab Abraham Laborio was another guy yeah um, Bill Maxwell is another guy that I studied. And then, you know, a lot of, just a lot of guys that were, you know, doing that. And that's what, and that's how I, and I just grew into that. I just started taking notes and just grew into this thing, you know, and the, and the next Ricky Dillard record that came around, you'll see between those two records and every record from, from a certain point, from maybe from 1993 to, you know, 2000. 2005 there was somewhat of a you know I don't want to talk about myself in the third person but there was somewhat of an evolution of Calvin Rogers because you could see the growth and you could see you know where the changes were happening you could hear them you know and it was just for me studying just you know for me going from you know taking that moment and saying you know okay I man I failed this recording I, I've, I've done it a disservice but I could make a choice. I could, I could say, man, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm going to continue doing what I do right. because I'm 13 years old and I'm, or I'm 14 years old. I'm the youngest guy here. People are smiling in my face and telling me how wonderful I am. And I'm just a kid or I can make an adult decision and say, Hey, I'm going to make myself better. And that's what I did. Um, you know, and those are things that, again, I think it's great that one of the things that you bring out is, you know, making strides even when you you know take taking strides and taking chances and music you know failures are something people you don't you don't hear people talk about a lot people right. talk about it when you you know when when you get one-on-one -on -one access with them but it's not right. so often that people in broad settings talk about their failures i love know? it man i love the f word 
You know, yeah, I, I absolutely. do. You know, like I, yeah. I talk about it all the time. I think that's one of the most important elements of of success and how people got to where they got to. You know, is the failures, not necessarily the successes. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, sir. And so I understand the same thing with you know with with the MD position with Fred. I started, you know, I, I started figuring out what it was that I was lacking, and I, I started getting up I, I, getting up on certain things. I made sure that I became more more than familiar with the with with the music um whether it be knowing the keys of the songs whether it be knowing where all the accents were where all the changes were i made sure i was more than familiar with that stuff mm-hmm. and uh so that i would at least know if for nothing else if if for nothing else if we have a song that fred has already recorded if for nothing else if i just say we're going to play it as is like it is on a record at least i know where everything goes right. i know where every part is and where everything happens and then i just learned how to become more uh, vocal in voicing my my opinions or, or my thoughts on arrangements and whether i, I just I, I learned I, I learned a lot about keyboards and playing them and start getting back to my keyboard groups. I, I took piano lessons. I said, you know, my dad initially tried to get me to be a keyboard player. So I took piano lessons mm-hmm. and that stuff stuck with me, even though I didn't do it long. I did it maybe a year, but it stuck with me and it's stuff that you don't forget. Right. And I remembered it and I just, you know, I began to enhance it. I took, you know, lots of theory courses. And when I was in high school, I went to performing arts. I took lots of theory and that kind of stuff. And so I just went back to my memory on that stuff and just said, I'm going to make a very, 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 um, a very direct effort to, you know, bring those things back to my remembrance and the things that I don't know, I'm going to make sure I learn. I'm going to try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, and it took some time, you know, we had, we had some shows where we didn't know what we were doing. We had some shows where I I put together arrangements and I worked on arrangements and they, they totally worked. Um, they, They totally didn't work. They went against everything that the vocals were doing. And I had to learn the difference between majors and minors and notation and how that stuff, how it affects when you play certain chords or notes over, Mm -hmm. over vocal changes and things like that. It would be, I would have come out with great ideas and I would hammer out ideas that I would spend hours and hours and hours on, you know, man, right. Seven, eight hours I would spend on, on an arrangement only to find out it doesn't work for the song. Mm. And you know, and but I, that's you know, frustrating. Along, it's frustrating, but yeah. you know, I never let that go. Oh man, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be bothered with this. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to give up on it. I say, I'm, I'm the next time I spend that much time on an arrangement, I'm going to make sure it works. So I'm going to know whatever it is that I need to know for that. Mm-hmm. That makes total sense. I want to, I want to go back a little bit about what you talked about, um, about playing on the record and starting to learn all of these other styles because a couple reasons. Um, one, I think that gospel music and chops are, you know, they're synonymous. So, yeah. And a lot of the of the sensation that a lot of people see on YouTube is just the chops aspect of it. And I think that that hinders a lot of people's playing because that's all they know how to play. So yeah. I want to I want to ask you how like I want to boil this down a little bit to, to hear how you really practice that stuff, because I you know, I know the listeners are going to say, OK, that's great. You went and listened to all these records, which is huge. You know, like yeah. Brian Fraser Moore always says, you are what you yeah. get. You know, you are yeah. what you listen to. Don Famolaro says, you know, you can't play like Steve Gadd if you li- haven't listened to a ton of Steve Gadd records. Uh-huh. Um so now how did you take that to the kit? Like, can you walk us through kind of like a, a practice session or, or a way that you actually applied what you were listening to your playing? Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, with I think with the, the very first influence, the, the first person that I probably gravitated more towards uh, was was a lot of Joel Smith. And, and actually, in me trying to research Joel Smith, um, I started going through a lot of studio records. I, I, I had some some live records from when he from from earlier when he was a very young guy, and his playing on those records was phenomenal. It was just so aggressive and explosive. And then um, I so and then I started I, I started going through those records and trying to find them. But I was I noticed that on the studio albums actually Joel wasn't playing a lot of drums. He was playing bass, mm-hmm. and Bill Maxwell was playing a lot of drums on his stuff. Oh. So, so, so I, as a kid, I probably, I probably wasn't wise enough to even say there's a reason why I just figured, oh, he played bass. So maybe he decided to play bass and Bill Max was going to play drums. But now that I notice that and I think about it, 
it, the reason probably why was because Joel was, you know, he probably wasn't just as settled as Bill Maxwell was maybe then. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bill Maxwell was a studio ace. I mean, this guy worked with Andre Crouch and he worked with the wine and see, not only was it an incredible producer, I mean, drummer, but it was a phenomenal producer. Right. And so I started listening to, I started listening to Bill Maxwell. And the very first thing I noticed about Bill Maxwell, the very first thing I noticed about him was the tone of his snare drum. Mm-hmm. I noticed the snare drum and his kick drum. So I started listening to that and I'm listening to him and I'm just going like, man, this, okay. This guy is very, very, at first, my first thought was he's very bland. He's very plain. Right. You know, I like Joel because he was ferocious. He was just explosive. But then I started listening to Bill and I'm going, man, he's very laid back. I wonder why did Joel play this song? And then I, but I kept listening to it and I kept listening to it and I kept studying. So then I just realized that I was having a harder time mimicking his simple playing than I was Joel's playing. Mm. It was really that simple for me. It was that, it, it, that was the, that was like the aha. It was like, and, and I was, I was very young when I reached, when, when I went through this, I was probably like maybe, you know, four, 14, 15 years old. Right. Uh, but I, I realized I was going, I was going back to those records and I would play a Joel song and I would play that, play that stuff. And, but then I realized when I started playing to the stuff that Bill Maxwell was plan on i started realizing like hey this is taking more effort and more concentration for me than any of the other stuff and i said earlier one of the first things i said is i grew up in church and we learned to do everything backwards so all of the crazy licks and fills and stuff and triples and doubles we learned how we that was what we did that was the stuff we play but for you know, for me, for as a drummer in gospel music, we we didn't we never kind of a lot of us go right past that. We go right past the fundamentals. Right. You know, so it's like it's 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 it's, 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 it's kind of like going going to the court and you see a guy that's on 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 a court on a basketball court at the park. And, and and he's running up and down the court doing 360 dunks and behind the back dunks. And he's doing alley-oops. He's throwing the ball off the backboard, catches it, and dunks the ball. But then you got a guy, and he plays. Then And then the guy comes in, and he, and he comes in, and they play a one-on-one game, and he's got all his fundamentals so he can dribble the ball. And his footwork is together. So this guy never gets a chance to – he never even gets a chance to showcase his dunks or his behind the back move or anything like that. He never gets a chance to showcase that because in a game, you got to have the fundamentals before you get to that point. Sure. Well, in music, you have to have the fundamentals before you can get to the point of mimicking any Steve Gadd chop or Tony Royster chop or any Weckl, Kali Yuta, any of those guys that you admire before you get there, you got to get to the fundamentals first. You got to be able to dribble the ball down the court. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of where it started for me. I, I realized, and I realized that uh, just really quickly. I noticed I was I was playing along to a Bill Maxwell record, and I noticed this is taking this is a little bit harder for me than anything I've played so far, and I'm not doing anything. Right. And so that was it for me. And so I just start. I just started. I started. You know, started all over again. It was like I it was like I almost just t- started teaching myself to play drums like I almost never played them before, hmm. you know. And so that was that was how I kind of that was how I went about it. I would sit down every day and I, I, I have students now I started teaching and I would sit down every day and I would give I, I tell tell guys. I said, OK, so here's here's the deal. We're going to set this metronome here right here next to us and we're going to play 200 bars of solid two and four, four, or, or, or four, four backbeat. So you got eighth notes on a snare and you've got uh, 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 half notes on a kick drum, half notes on a snare drum. And that's it. 200 bars. And that's all I don't want to hear. An open high. I don't want to hear anything. A lot of music. So hard like, to do. It's, it's hard, but you know, and I, and I think me personally, uh, I think as musicians, a lot of us kind of develop a, a certain form of ADD mm-hmm. as a musician, you know, so those kind of things, you know, it, it kind of it kind of takes us back. It's, it's hard for us to get into that, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's hard for, for us to develop that serious concentration. Another thing for me, another moment for me and a, a, another tool that helped me, I remember seeing Ricky Lawson playing with uh, Michael Jackson mm-hmm. at the live live in Bucharest. 
they showed it on HBO. I remember watching it the night they showed it. I, it came on. I remember watching it in real time. And I remember when they got to, uh, uh, they got to Billy G. At the end of the song, the stage goes black and there's a spotlight. And all there is is Ricky Lawson playing this solid back beat right. against Michael. And Michael danced for probably about eight, nine, ten minutes. And I mean, Ricky Lawson did not move. Right. He didn't move. And that I was just like, I've never heard anything like that. I was sure. I said, they, they turned on a drum machine or something <laughs> like that. Like, he just fades away and the drum machine has taken over. They sampled his sounds because he never moved. And when I saw him playing it and I realized it was him playing it, again, that was a moment where I said, that's something that I need to work on. And so, again, that re, it relit that fire in me to tell me, okay, go back to working on that. So that was really that was really my process for a long time. It just And it was that, it was that easy for me to notice, you know, it just became easier. And I think, you know, a lot of drummers go, you know, well, how, you know, when you, like you said, you say, well, how did you change that? How did you change that? I still, I still put in time and, and found time to get behind the drums and try and be creative. But I realized even with my ideas and I hear drums all day long and I have most of my life, but I hear drums all day long and, uh, you know, I'm always having ideas, but I got to the point where I realized I'll never, there'll never come a moment in a song where I can try those creative ideas out or I can try those moments out if I can't get through the song. Right. So that was kind of just it for me. You know, that, that's how, that's how, that's really literally how it happened for me. I, th I think that's amazing because it's, it's, it's like the guy, you know, not to steal your basketball analogy, but it's the guy that you see out there on the court that, that is, yeah. that does a hundred free throws. And then he does a hundred shots from the corner and then moves yeah. over three inches and takes a hundred more and then a hundred more, you know, and, and, and really, really honing that skill and reducing everything. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, what I did years ago was I was, I was in a touring band and I was recording the shows and I would go home and listen to him and I was like, man, I play a lot of drums. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I just, I took the drums away, man. I did like, I did like a two, two, two and a half month tour with, with a kick, a snare and a hi-hat. And, and that was and, it. And man, that's another great point that that was something else. That's, that's, and that's another great point that you brought up man something that drummers have gotten away from is recording yourselves not just when you're alone practicing but in those live musical settings that's something that i learned even when i when i started you know when i started getting lessons i, I studied i didn't necessarily have lessons but i went to perform in art school and i i, I got uh, we had a program called ravinia jazz mentors that was headed by Ramsey Lewis and I went on to work with Ramsey Lewis after I got out of school but I was, it was I met him as a part of this program and it's, it's you know it's it's the reason why I don't know if any people that have anything to do with schools are listening but this is why we have to keep music in schools because I was on the verge of probably ruining my life I had the wrong influences behind me now I know I told you guys I came out of church I grew up in church I did but as life grew on I went and I became influenced by the wrong people at one point in my life mm -hmm. and I was probably at a point where I, I was at I, I got to a point where I had to make a decision between whether or not I was going to try the music thing or whether or not I was going to be a street kid or try to be a street kid and be influenced by a guy standing out on the corner and the Ravinia Jazz Mentors program that they had at the school I went to was basically a program where professional jazz musicians that worked with the likes of Ramsey Lewis and uh, 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 Diane Reeves, uh, we had Orbert Davis there. I mean, so many of these musicians had resumes uh, that, that were just miles and miles along. These musicians would go into the public schools of Chicago and they would listen at their bands. They would listen to the to, to the bands perform, and then they would take the you know the student. They would take certain students out of these bands, and they would spend time with them one on one, give them private lessons, basically, mm -hmm. you know. And the guy that was there in the band when I was a part when I was at Curie High School, the guy that was there was a guy named Ernie Adams. He played with a. He, he, he played with Diane Reeves and he played with Ramsey, but he also played with, uh, he played with Frank Gambali and he played with another guy. I can't remember this guitar player's name from, uh, he used to play with Chick Corea's electric band. Hmm. 
Um, but he played with this guy. And so one day he came to the school and I was supposed to be there for a lesson with him. He came and he was just going to help me. I was going to show me some things. And uh, I got there late. And he hung around and waited for me. I probably showed up, showed up back to the band room about 30, 40 minutes late. And uh, he said, and he pulled me to the side. He said, hey, man, I've been here waiting for you. Where have you been? And uh, I said, man, you know, I've been outside hanging out, you know. He said, yeah, man, he said, you, 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 he said, you hanging out with the, with, the, with the tough dudes on the corner. That's what you want to do? Is that what you want to do, man? And he said, man, I'm telling you, ain't no future in that. And he said to me, he said, man, he said, You've got a chance to do something with your life. You're good with the drums and you're good at it. You can hear it, man. It, it's, it's effortless for you. You can do drums as, as well as you can walk down the street. That's how easy it is for you, man. He said, but you're going to lose that thing that you have if you continue down the road that you're going down. And I, and it was, and, and I made a decision. I said, man, I'm, I'm going to give this a try because hmm. I had friends that I went to school with that didn't show back up the next year because the guys were somewhere they shouldn't have been or somewhere where, you know, just something bad happened at the wrong place at the wrong time. And you come back to school the next year and the guy's not there. He's either dead or in jail. Yep. That that's something that 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 moment right there kind of saved my life, you know. And hmm. so I could I continued on with the music thing, continued on with it. And so um, but Ernie Adams was a guy he and I would tell him, I said, man, you know, I, I play out. And he was impressed by the fact that I was a young guy and I was making money from playing already. You know, I was telling him, I said, right. man, you know, I, I play drums at a church and I make, at this point, you know, I was, I was in my, maybe my third year of high school, I was making maybe 125 bucks a week. He's <laughs> like, man, that is good money for yeah. you, man. Yeah. He's like, that's good money for you, man. What do you need to hang out with those guys for? You know? And so, but. And I so was what was it? Was it more of like, more of just trying to fit in? Try, absolutely trying to fit in. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and, and like I said, when you're, you know, every teenager probably goes through a moment where they, you know, they feel like, you know, they're an outcast because especially when you when you have when you have the artist thing inside of you, when you're artistic, you definitely whether you're a painter or whether you whether you write songs or play the guitar, or whether you dance, you know, a poet. I think all of us at some point, we know that we're not like everyone else. Right. And I we think that. Going in high school, depending on the neighborhood, because I know that it was like this where I grew up too. That like, it was it wasn't really that cool if you're a guy yeah. and you do that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely. it was like you got you got picked on and teased and. Yeah, because and, we got we 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 go by our own rules. We don't follow trends. We don't we don't wear what's popular. You know, all the other guys were at school and they're wearing baggy clothes and hanging the pants are hanging down and oversized sweatshirts and t-shirts and my clothes. I bought my clothes to fit. You right. know, so, <laughs> you know, so uh, you know that kind of stuff is, and you so you go through that and you start trying to figure out. You know, well, let me give this a shot. Let me see what happens when I do this. And so I, I went through that. I did that. And, you know, luckily, again, this this program that they had in place uh, uh, and it was called Jazz Mentors. And it was it was it should have been like life mentors or something like that, because, I mean, these guys really were there to help you get through life, not just to become a good musician. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, and I, I went to school. I went to a school called Curie Performing Arts High School in Chicago. And I don't know if you know Keith Harris that plays with Black yeah. Eyed Peas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keith Harris taught me to read music. He was oh, a, really? He was a couple of years ahead of me. He went to the same school. Um, so he was a part of that program. Um, guy named Anthony Wanzi, same thing with him, you know. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of guys come in and out of that school. So, um, you know, but I was a part of that program, and it, it, it helped me. It completely changed my life. And so, um, but Ernie, I, the, the point I was making about the, the thing I was getting to was that Ernie, one of the things he told me, he said, man, when you go out and play your gigs on the weekends or you play at church, record yourself playing and then listen right. back to it. And that's what would happen with me. I would, I would be playing and I would go back and listen to the drums and I'm like, man, I'm still playing a lot. And so it was a right. constant process. It was a constant process. Even when you think you're making these huge strides and you, you're going, I'm playing less than what I was playing before, and you go back and listen to it, and it's like it still sounds like a lot. Right, right. The music still isn't breathing. I'm still, I'm still playing, playing, blowing, play, blowing over a vocal, or you know, playing a chop over a a, a, a lead vocal or, or a, a sax part or something like that. You know, right, so right. it just taught me to, and it helped me it taught me to, to start listening as well, um, not just 
after the gig, but listen while I'm on the gig. I listen to the players that I'm playing with. I, mm-hmm. I pay attention to what they're doing, and we begin to have conversations. You know what I'm saying? If if me and you on a, on this phone talking and we're both talking at the same time nobody would be able to get anything from what we're saying exactly. no matter how important it is the no no matter how important what we're saying is if we're both talking at the same time nobody would be able to get anything from this conversation right so music is the same way you know no matter how great the lick or the chop is that you play if we if i play it in conjunction with the bass player playing a, a, a long field at the same time everyone's going to miss it Mm-hmm. You know, nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to be able to get anything from that from that conversation. <laughs> it's funny that you say that because every morning I get up and I go through like this little morning routine, go to the gym um, and then I make breakfast and the Today Show is always on. And after the Today Show, there's some show called it's like Kathy Lee and Hoda or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I always have to turn it off. I, I'm not really interested in it, but I always have to turn it off because all they do is talk over each other the whole entire time. <laughs> Yes. It's just it, it's just annoying to me, you know. I'm like, what? Why don't one person talk and then the other person? Talk? And, and the whole time, I mean, I was like, I had it on today. I was like, I can't even understand what what's happening right now because they're both talking. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> That's the perfect example too. Yeah, yeah, man. So I want to ask you. Um, I know we're we're you know I got you on here for almost 50 minutes now, so I'll let you go soon. But I wanted I wanted to ask you. Um, about the R. Kelly gig and how that whole thing came about and why uh, you decided to leave. Yeah. Okay. Well, and so um, uh, back to jazz mentors. So after I graduated high school, I decided not to go on the road. I mean, I decided not to go to college. I wanted just I just wanted to play. And so um, I, I worked a job for a little while. I had this, had this job, and this is just a quick side story. I had this job. A friend of my dad's got me a job at a place called Share Marketing Corporation. I was doing data entry. And I get a call one day from Ramsey Lewis's office and he's like, I'm looking for Calvin. And he called my, my parents home and left a message and said, mm-hmm. I'm looking for Calvin Rogers. And uh, can you have him call me back? This is uh, the office of Ramsey, Ramsey Lewis. And so I call down the Ramsey studio. My stepmother calls and says, hey, you got a voicemail message from someone at Ivory Pyramid Studios. I call back Ramsey saying, hey, man, my drummer which was Ernie Adams, the guy from Jazz Mentors. Mm-hmm. My drummer can't do uh, this weekend of, of gigs with me. And uh, he says that you are more than ready to do this gig, but uh, I need you to come and rehearse. I need you to come and do these rehearsals. We're going to rehearse for two days. And so he said the rehearsal is going to be on Thursday and Friday. And then the gigs, the two gigs are on, they're both on Saturdays. One is this weekend and one is the next weekend following. Mm-hmm. So I said, I'm like, okay, great. So I call Ramsey back and I, I get on the phone I, and uh, he said, well, the rehearsals are Thursday and Friday. He said the rehearsals are going to be from like 12 to 4 down in my studio. Right. I said, okay, cool. So I go and ask my boss. I said, say to my boss, I say, man, I just got this call. Ramsey Lewis called me and, uh, man, I met him in high school. He's a famous jazz man. He said, no, oh, I listen to Ramsey Lewis. I listen to his morning show on my way in to work. You know, <laughs> I'm like, great, man. He's like, yeah, well, listen, he called me. He wants me to play with him this week, but the rehearsals are Thursday and Friday. So listen, man, um, can I take Thursday and Friday off and I'll come in and work Saturday and Sunday? You know, and he was just like, nah, I can't really do that, man. Um, you just started here and I can't give you any days off, man. Um, and he gives me this whole speech about, you know, drums. And he's like, I know you like the drums. and I know you like music, but, uh, you know, man, you know, you're, you're older now. You just graduated high school. You're going to have to start thinking about how you're going to take care of yourself. You're going to make a living for yourself. Mm-hmm. And so you may have to find some other outlet to be able to play drums. You know, you have to find somebody that can do a rehearsal or do it and do a jam band or something like that, you know, after the hours that you get off work, you know. And so uh, he said, I mean, I'm not going to give you the days off. And that's kind of it. And so uh, I said, okay. And I went back to my desk and I worked through lunch and I went back after lunch and uh, I went to go, go go to lunch. And I said, hey, man, listen, uh, I appreciate you giving me a chance. I know you're friends with my dad and I know that's why I got this job. And I hope I don't ruin it for someone that needs it. But this is not my stop. So uh, I, I, I left. And I, I went. I told him, I said, I won't be back after lunch. It doesn't make sense for me to waste you guys time. And well, I won't be back for lunch. Wow. I went. I went uh, I went and did the rehearsals with Ramsey, and I, I played with him for years after that. I, I, I took over with the band Urban Nights after Omar Akeem, after Urban Nights. Uh, I did Urban Nights 3. Mm-hmm. I did Urban Urban Nights 3 and 4. He did Urban Nights with uh, Omar Akeem and Sonny Emery. And after that, 
I started, I, I took over and I did the next three records with him, with Ramsey, and then I started touring. So Ramsey introduced me to a guy named Vince Lawrence, who's a DJ, and but he's also, he's, he also had his hand in a, a lot of different things like, uh, you know, commercial and radio jingles, TV jingles, stuff like that. So he calls me one day and he's like, hey man, there's a producer that has a room down here at the studio, needs a drummer on a commercial. Can you come down? I'm like, cool. So I come down and I'm setting up my drums, setting up my drums and we, we get, get the drums mic'd and everything. And then, uh, I start sound checking my drums and just so happens that this same studio, R. Kelly had a room in. And so I'm sitting there, I'm sound checking my drums and literally R. Kelly walks past the room <laughs> and he's standing there listening to, he stops and he stands there and listen to me sound check my drums. And I'm just playing a lot of pocket, playing a lot of two and four, getting lined up with the click. And uh, Did you know he was there? I had no idea he was no. there. My little brother was with me, and my little brother was sitting, my little brother was sitting face facing towards me. So he's looking and R. Kelly was standing behind him behind me. So he's looking at R. Kelly like with the wide eye. Like he's like in amazement. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so um R so R. Kelly's standing there and so they tell they so I stop playing. They say, "Okay, man, we got tones and everything. You can hear the click." And I'm like, "Yeah." And uh, he tells me something. He said, "Man, I think he said man, we we're hearing a little rattle or something." So I, I bent over to fix something on my kick drum, and uh, when I sat back up, R. Kelly was standing over me, and he's just like, "Man, you sound really good." And I'm like, "Man, you are R. Kelly." <laughs> so. Um, He's, he's like, man, you sound really good, man. Um, What's your name? I said, my name is Calvin Rogers. She said, man, okay. He's like, man, are you from Chicago? I said, yes, sir. She's like, cool, man. Um, Do you play with anyone? I said, man, I play a lot of gospel music. And at the time, I was playing with John P. Key. Mm-hmm. I told him I played with John P. Key, and he was like, man, I love John P. Key. I, he's like, I, I love gospel music, man. I love it. So he's like, man, I'm going to send somebody over here to talk to you. So he sends Donnie Lyle over there, who's his music director. Mm-hmm. And Donnie Lyle comes over and says, Hey man, Rob told me to get your information. He, uh, he's, he's about to put a band together for his next tour. And I'm like, oh, okay, sure. Well, here, here's my number. And, uh, I kind of didn't think I didn't, I never expected to hear from him. Uh, I gave him my number and I, I finished my session and then I was it. And then, uh, a few months later I started, uh, I started playing with, I was playing with David Hollister, who was a part of Black Street with Teddy, Teddy Riley at the mm-hmm. time. And so I was playing with David Hollister and I, I knew that R. Kelly had put a band together. Sure enough, he put a band together and they'd hired a different drummer, but the drummer wasn't working out. And, uh, so they sent R. Kelly told, told his music director, he said, man, what happened to the guy that I asked you to get his number from, get his number at the studio? And he said, uh, oh, yeah. He said, yeah, man, I got I got to find a guy's information. Well, it just turns out that the guy that played bass with me with John P. Key was in this. They had hired him for the R. Kelly band. So uh. he said, man, he said, man, uh, I can't remember. I, I don't know what I did with his information. He said, man, he said, man, the guy that played with John P. Key. He said, yeah. And then the bass player goes, you guys are talking about Calvin. He said, yeah, that's the guy's name, Calvin <laughs> Rod. He said, that's the guy named Calvin. He said, that's my boy. And so he said, man, do you, do you do you know how to get in contact with him? He said, man, he's right around the corner at a rehearsal hall rehearsing with Dave Hollister. Hmm. So they so so they get in the car and R. Kelly's music director and, and my, my friend Tony Russell, who now is he's bass player. He's playing with a bunch of artists right now, but he's doing uh, he, he was doing he did Jay-Z for a long time. And now he's doing Kendrick Lamar. Oh, he's man. relocated to L.A. He comes around the corner and gets me at this band rehearsal and it's like, hey, man. Uh, we got a drummer here with R. Kelly, but it's not really working out. And Rob just asked about you. So uh, can you come tonight, come to rehearsal and an audition? I said, absolutely. So I go to this audition with R. Kelly. He's not there. It's just a couple of the texts and the band. And they put on this R. Kelly song. And the first thing they say, he says, man, he, they, they had given me a CD. And I basically had a number of hours to learn this R. Kelly song, which was I Wish. Had a number of hours to learn this song, learning kick patterns. And I'd known quite a few drummers that work with R. Kelly. And so I knew that he was very, uh, he was very, um, can you hear me, Nick? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I knew that he was very, very, 
like very meticulous about drum, the drum parts being very, very dead on. He wanted it exactly precise like the album. Right. So I learned the parts just the way they were. And I play, uh, I go to the rehearsal and I learn the parts. And the first thing they do is ask me, say, can you play with a click track? And I'm like, yeah. So I play with a click track and I play the song just straight like it was, like the record. And he says to me, he said, man, I'm very surprised that you played the song just straight like the record because we had a lot of gospel guys come down here and audition and then all of them were just playing all over the place and they couldn't play or they couldn't play with a click. Right. And so he said, well, man, can you do any of those? He said, the reason why Rob wanted a gospel drummer is because he likes the flash and the flair of gospel musicians, but he also needs the discipline of a professional, you know, R&B drummer. Right. So they said, man, let me hear you play the same song and we we'll want to hear you stretch over it, play some chops or solo over it. So I played it and he's just like, man, you got the job. That's it. Nice. Toured with R. Kelly from about 2000 to maybe 2003, 2004. And then things kind of went haywire with him mm-hmm. to the United States and Europe and Africa. And then I worked with down at the studio for him from time, with, with him from time to time. I'd help him design sounds and studio uh, drum programming and stuff like that. Um, and so after that, he, he went through his legal problems. And I was trying to decide, you know, whether or not I was going to go to L.A. And, you know, this when everybody was kind of the L.A. thing was kind of becoming very popular. A lot of tours were going out and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I just had my son. My son was young and I was trying to decide if I wanted to leave Chicago. And I just decided that I didn't. But I know I wanted to keep playing. But as much as I enjoyed working with R. Kelly, I enjoyed the discipline that I learned from it. Uh, I enjoyed the the all of the different things that I learned from working with him and I learned how to be a music director really that was kind of how I learned about you know how how a music director runs a band was I learned that from Donnie Lyle uh you know and it wasn't just his it wasn't how he taught or arranged it was more so his temperament and how he set the tone for how a band should work and how we keep everything running smooth I learned all of that from watching Donnie Lyle Mm. but and so when uh, I got done with R. Kelly, I was just trying to decide, I mean, do I want to pursue, you know, R&B gigs or, and I just really, really wanted to play gospel music. It's what I wanted to do. Um, it's the thing that's closest to me. I'm a Christian and I just believed in my heart. I was like, you know, man, and people were saying, man, there's no way to make money really playing. You can't take care of yourself doing that. You know, guys are making, you know, $3,500 a week playing, you know, touring music, you know, R&B music and stuff like that. And I was just like, Man, I just, I believe something different for me. Right. And uh, and so I, I was just, I, I didn't know where to start. And I was just favored, man. Uh, one of the first things that happened, like re- immediately after that, uh, I, I I came back home from tour and I, I met, I did another record with Ricky Dillard um, after I finished that, that last R. Kelly tour. I did another record with Ricky Dillard and I met Donald Lawrence. And then I I met Donald Lawrence and I started working with him and I started doing sessions. And then, so this is like 2003, 2000, this is like 2002, maybe, um, 2000, 2003, this is 2003. And so I meet Donald Lawrence and then I immediately start going back to working on my studio chops. So I'm making sure that I'm dead on with the click and I know how to play a studio song because now I'm working in the studio with Donald Lawrence and we're playing all these beautiful big ballads. But the band goes first. So there's no vocal or no demo. I don't I gotta find a way to excite these songs. Right, right, and right. make it you know, church is church gospel music is about emotion, it's about lifts and builds and things like that. So, you know, I have to find a way to make this music feel like it's all happening in real time, like the choir's in there with us. Right. And I have to excite excite this music, but I also gotta make sure I don't speed the track up. And I gotta make sure I don't take off, you know, and everything is just there. And we're talking about songs that are the 30, 40 BPMs. That's that's slow. That is slow. That's super slow, you know. And so um I, I immediately get back to my grind, working in the studio, making sure I I'm I'm dead on with that and I start growing myself there. And uh and then it, it went from there. It went from me working with Donald Lawrence to working with other producers, Sanchez Harley, who produced for Kirk Franklin and produced for uh, Lamar Campbell and he produced for CC Winans. And, and then it went from there for me, from there to me working with, uh, to me meeting Fred Hammond and meeting Fred and then 
so on and so forth, man. The chain began to fall. I met mean, Percy Beatty, and I just began to become in Chicago and in gospel music. I just began to come become this guy that everybody's like, man, he really knows how to do records. And that came a lot of that came from me studying one of the guys that I mentioned earlier, who's uh, Terry uh, Terry Baker. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I came from me studying him a lot, and I, he was one of the guys in studying Ricky Lawson. So what I just started to do was I started to take from all these guys who I influenced, who influenced me. Weckle was a huge influence for me. I love his, I love his consistency. Mm-hmm. I love how he is him, no matter where he is. Right. And so that was one thing I, I, I figured out. You know, I don't have to be a machine. I don't have to be mechanical. I can still be me. But I'll take what I learned from Ricky Lawson and from Terry Baker and be solid, be, you know, always keep great time, make the song feel good. Mm-hmm. But I also learned how to be me. And me is had a little flash of Teddy Campbell in it because he was my biggest influence from the time I was like 15 to right, like right. 20. You know, he was just he was he was more back to the whole Joel Smith thing. Just is he a Chicago and, guy? He's from. Yeah, from Chicago. We grew up right around the corner from each other. OK, because, my do you know, Felix Pollard. Actually, Felix is Felix the same way. I, I knew Felix before I knew Teddy. When I was telling you about my dad being a musician and all mm-hmm. the guys that I sat up under, Felix Pollard was one of those guys. Oscar Seaton was another one of those guys. Uh, Teddy Campbell was one of those guys. Uh, um, let me let me give you some more. I don't know if you know Ray Beatty. He was yeah, one of the first yeah. live drummers for R. Kelly. All those guys, in a ton, all of the gospel guys, Kevin Brunson. So all of those guys, I mean, I sat up under all these guys at the time. I was like seven, eight years old, right. just watching these guys become, you know, the the very popular and legendary musicians that they are. I, just, I was there then. when when And all these guys have been super bad for years. Oscar was the one I talked about playing the 200 bars of solid pocket. Oscar's the one who very was the very, very first guy that did that to me. I remember I went to Oscar's house one day. And I, I was standing at his door, banging on his door for about 30 minutes because I could hear him upstairs just going, wailing away on the drums, <laughs> wailing away. And he finally lets me in. And, man, I sat there and watched him practice for probably another hour. And then he had to go. And so he said, man, come back tomorrow. I'm going to set up another kit. He sets up a kit. Got my, I'm excited because I'm like, man, he's going to show me all these crazy chops and feels he's playing yesterday. And he sits down and he puts a pair of Vic Firth metronome headphones on me. Mm-hmm. And he shows me this solid groove, eighth notes, half notes. And he says, play that until I come back and get you. And I'm like, wait a minute. What happened to all the stuff you were playing yesterday? That I, I, That's what I came here for. And he's just like, we'll get to that later. Play this until I come back and get you. And I swear, and I swear to I mean, I sat there for 30 minutes, man, struggling to play with that click track and making sure I was dead on. So, you know, those, those are guys, you know, and so – those are the guys that were influences. So it was little pieces of all of those guys that, you know, I found myself in and then I just kind of evolved into, you know, what I was. And then, you know, you have the, the, you know, the influences of everyone else, everyone that you hear and, and, and being traveling the world and hearing all these different kinds of music now, learning different rhythms and all of that stuff. And you, you just continue to grow, you know? I like it, man. I love, and I, I love the fact that, you know, you, you carved out your own course, you know, from being yeah. at that job and you saying, listen, man, I, you know, this isn't my calling. And then and then doing the R. Kelly stuff and saying, you know, this isn't it either. I want to I yeah. want to do gospel. And, and and that just proves to show that if you you know, you got a dream and you and you got enough desire to do it, you can you can go do it. Yeah, absolutely. And then also, but I think it goes to speak for the fact that you don't always have to follow the lane that everyone else is taking. You know, right. you don't have to follow everyone else's path. You know, like I said, everyone was kind of on the whole, I'm going to L.A. thing. And I just felt like, like L.A. is not for me. I don't think that's what I'm supposed to do. I don't think that's what I want to do. Not even what I'm supposed to do. I'm just not even sure if that's what I want to do. And so I went from there and I just, you know, I just went and said, you know, I'm going to try my I, I really want to do this. This is where I want to be. You know, this is what I want to do. And I, and I and I would do, you know, R&B things from time to time. I, You know, I, I still do it now. I play with the Isley Brothers now. I've been touring with them for the last four or five years. Uh, you know, and, and, and in 2000, all of 2013, I, I, I toured with Aretha Franklin. You know, and I've nice. done sessions for, you know, I've done some sessions for tons of guys, Avant, and, you know, uh, uh, uh a ton, ton, just you know, a lot of different people. I've done that, you know, and and I enjoy it. It's cool, uh, but 
you know, when they say home is where the heart is, and for me, home is gospel music, you know, and that's that's where I feel like I'm most effective. Um, because I'm all about at the end of the day, one thing, one of my biggest things is about influence. I, I love, I love the power of influence right. and, uh, I'm all about influence. I, I, I more than anything, I want to leave something for people to go behind. Even after I'm not here, mm-hmm. that's, that's why I got into recording albums. I, I didn't, I, one reason I wanted to record was because I, I felt like it was history. And long after I'm gone, this music will live beyond me, you know, and people will hear it and be able to go back and say, oh, I hate it or I love it or I don't really get it or I like this guy better. But it'll be something. It'll be the thing. Maybe possibly could even be the thing that changed everything like it did for me. Sure. You know, studying albums and and and, and developing a passion for drums. You know, mm-hmm. that that's what it did for me. And it changed everything for me. And maybe just hopefully, you know, it's, it's I, I'm hoping that it does that, man. 50 years from now, you know, or 75 years from now, some kid will be sitting in front of whatever they're using to play music from at that point, And he'll find an old CD and have to find a way to play it probably or itunes or you have to find however way we'll listen to me they'll they'll listen to music then right at that point he'll find a way to play and he'll put that in and he'll he'll feel something and say that's what i want to do and i want to make people feel this way from my drumming or from 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 the way he plays or arranges or right to produce or whatever it is sure absolutely yeah. man and i think that you're uh i think you're you're on the right track definitely what? <laughs> so, so what's the what's the future hold for you? What do you uh, what are some things that you're working on now and some things that you're excited about? I'm very I'm still very excited about playing drums, man. I had a rough year in 2012. I lost my dad and then I went through a brutal attack, man, when some guys robbed me and I was left with a broken arm. And, oh, man. Uh, yeah. And uh, this, this, this guys robbed me, brought a house and I, I, I had a broken arm and uh, torn retina, broken nose and. All this happened in 2012 while my dad is fighting for his life and ultimately, you know, he met his demise. So, uh, you know, I kind of after that, after having a broken arm, uh, I wasn't able to play drums for about seven weeks, seven or eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And the doctors initially told me it would probably be more like six or seven months. And uh, but I recovered very, very, very quickly. And my arm is better than it ever was. And so but. During that time, man, I just really, really, really came uh, to realize how much I enjoyed playing drums. Right. So, uh, so I I got back into that, and uh, I I really kind of got back to that point where I just really started loving how to play, love loving playing drums again. Mm-hmm. You know, because I played drums probably every day of my life, and then it just went away for seven or eight weeks, and it's like somebody's just cut the air off man yeah you're struggling to breathe so it was like that for me and so I've, i'm i'm very excited about playing drums again all over again it's it's taking on this whole, whole new meaning to me um so i've been doing that um uh, and i've been i've been doing a lot of writing and producing and so um that's something that i'm very excited about because i've it's it that now intrigues me just as much as playing um you know, finding mm-hmm. another way to express yourself uh, through music, you know, uh, through the power of the power of lyric and songwriting is a very, very, very tedious and very hard process. Man. Yes, it is. People, people that have the gift of songwriting, I admire them so much because, you know, placing words together and conveying your emotions, it's not like a text. You have to find the right word and it's got to make sense. Mm-hmm. It's a very, very hard process, but I've been studying and uh, I've been trying my hand at it and I've had some songs uh, last, I think last year or the year before last song I co-wrote with Fred Hammond was nominated for a Grammy. And, That's awesome. Uh, so we've had some success, you know, I've, I've been able to, um, I've been able to write this, uh, this year in two, 2000 and well, 2014, uh, I, this is probably my biggest body of work so far. Well, my problem, I co-wrote about eight songs with Fred Hammond on his new album. Nice. And I wrote a lot of it. I, I extended, you know, a very, even extended my hand in the lyrical process on this pro, on this project. And uh, and wrote a lot of songs with him, a lot, a lot of music. And now we've got, I've got artists that I'm working with. I've got a few artists at my production company, Synergy Music Group. Um, 
uh, we've got a few artists that we're working on that are about to release in the next uh, in the next few months. So those are things that I'm working on, and I'm also now you know I'm getting back into you know going uh, into other areas of music now. I'm, you know going uh, I'm gonna go. I'm, I'm, you know, going back and forth between Chicago and Nashville mm-hmm. and uh, trying my hand at some of the other music there, you know, working. I've, I've been there and worked there in the studios quite often, and I love the studios in Nashville. And so um, I've gone back and forth there for, you know, for the past few years, working with the likes of Tommy Sims and Israel Houghton and, you know, some of those guys and um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going back and forth there now, possibly even maybe relocating and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, going to try to try my hand at the, you know, maybe at the pop scene at the country scene and the studio scene there, cool. um, just to, you know, just to, to give, I, I really, really would like to make way for some of the younger drummers that are behind me in gospel music, uh, but not necessarily ready just to stop playing. So, you know, but I'm, I, I really, I'm all about, you know, trying to share and, and, and trying to, you know, help to mold guys into and, and, and mentor guys into that place, you know, where they can become the true professionals that necessarily that they probably, you know, that's that is in them to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So where can people go to learn more about you if they want to keep keep up with what you're doing? Well, um, my, my website is being built right now, so um It'll be there'll be a link to that soon. I don't want to give out the address and it ends up wrong because we've had some issues with the uh, with the name thing, uh, the domain. But for right now, um, I'm on Facebook and you can visit me at Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash Calvin dot Rogers number two. Or and and there's a fan and I and I have a fan page on Facebook as well, which is www.facebook.com slash Calvin C Rod Rogers. And that's Calvin C A L V I N C R O D then R O D G E R S. And then I'm also on Twitter and Instagram, which is at Calvin R underscore Rogers. And Rogers is with a D. And so I'm constantly posting there, you know, and you'll, you'll be able to find the links to my websites there uh, very, very, very soon. You'll find all of that stuff there. And I'm working with, you know, uh, with my companies getting ready to release some some materials. And uh, I'm very excited. I recently joined the Pearl Drums family and uh, it's been a nice. great experience, man. And Mike Ferris and Kevin Bly have really, really just really uh, helped me out and, and they've just taken such great care of me in the, in the, uh, my first two years that I've been there, man. And so I'm working on, you know, some things for them and you got to check out the new Pearl stuff. It's great. They got the new acrylic drums, the crystal beat kit. I've heard a lot of amazing things about it and I have it. And when I was at NAMM, I didn't even like, I I just spaced on go like checking out the Pearl stuff and I don't know why I did. Oh man. It's, it's, it's absolutely killer, man. So it's absolutely really, uh, a kill. It's absolutely killer. Nice. The acrylic drums are, are, are absolutely, and they got these new uh, hybrid wood and uh, carbon fiber uh, combination kits that are very, very cool. And, uh, you know, of course, the reference drums and the reference pures are, you know, those are standards. And so. Right. Awesome. Very, 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 very dope. Awesome. Well, Calvin, thanks so much for uh, for taking all this time, man. I really, I really do appreciate it, man. It was definitely inspiring, and I just, I just, I appreciate what you do, man. And I appreciate the fact that you, uh, that you, that you carved your own path and, and went your own way rather than following everyone else's. So I applaud you on that. Well, I truly appreciate that, Nick, and I appreciate uh, even man you taking a moment to have me on your show. I never take for granted that when people give you a platform to speak about yourself or you know what it is you're doing, man. So many incredible drummers out here, and I'm always, you know, I'm always humbled by the fact that people, you know, take the time out to even to mention my name, man. And and I'd like to, you know, thank you and wish you the best of luck with with the podcast, man. And I'll definitely from now on, I'm I'm going to be tuned in and locked in because as I heard man you've had all of my favorite drummers on there most of my favorite drummers so i'm looking forward to just seeing the rest of my favorite drummers and some guys that i don't know about you know right all right you know i'm I'm looking very very forward to that man and hopefully uh everything will work out man i really appreciate you having me on 
Thank you, man. I, I appreciate all that. You saying all that. And yeah, man, it was, it was an honor. And thank you to, uh, to Eric Hernandez for, for introducing. Yeah. Shout him, out, so. shout out to, to Eric Hernandez. Who's the drummer for one of my favorite artists right now. Bruno Mars, man. Yes, I mean, sir. Eric is killing it right now. He yeah, is. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, man. To Eric. Well, cool, man. So, uh, yeah, we'll take care. Keep doing what you're doing. And again, thank you so much. And I'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. Thanks, Nick. All right. Thanks, Calvin. All right. See you. There you have it, the one and only Calvin Rogers. And to get the show notes of everything that we talked about and how you can connect with Calvin further and keep an eye on what he's doing, check out drummersresource.com forward slash session 90. And there will be all the show notes on there. Also, if you're looking to grow your fan base and increase your exposure and ultimately get more gigs, check out my free webinar, Marketing for the Modern Musician. And it's 100% free, and I'll walk through how you can do all of that stuff through social media and through mailing lists and through your website to really grow your grow your fan base, increase your exposure, and ultimately get more gigs. You can learn more at drummersresource.com forward slash register. And until the next podcast, keep drumming. Thank you so much for listening. I really do appreciate it. And if you dig the podcast, do me a favor. Leave me a rating and review on iTunes. I would really, really, really appreciate that. And the question of the day is, how do you work on your groove? And I want to hear your answers in the comments section at drummersresource.com forward slash session 90. And with that, I'm gone. Peace.